So, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, it is going to be an exciting day of information, discussion, and much more. And so it is time to get into our first panel discussion. This one is surrounded around how we really preserve, transfer, and really carry on our culture through our museums and heritage. And on this panel, we have with us an elite panel for sure. We have Zachary Beer, cultural and heritage archaeologist at the UWI Mona. We also have Shani Roper, head of UWI Mona's museum and also the former head of Liberty Hall IOJ, a division of the Ministry of Culture, who may be our uh, co-moderator this morning. We also have O'Neill Lawrence, National Gallery of Jamaica IOJ, Division of the Ministry of Culture. Also joining us for our first panel discussion is Miss Georgia Rockwood. We also have Miss Nicole Patrick Shaw from IOJ, Division of the Ministry of Culture. And rounding out our panelists, we have Sarah Sh Shabaka, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Shara, Kingston Creatives Tour App. She's going to be talking to us as well. And the session ought to be moderated by Dr. Sonia Stanley Naya. We know that once we say culture, we have to say Dr. Sonia Stanley Naya from the Institute of Caribbean Studies. So she will be joining us uh, later on. But as we begin, we are going to ask Shani Roper, head of UWI Museum, to begin moderating this panel. Everyone. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today for what is a very important discussion in the museum and heritage field. So our panel focuses on museum and heritage institutions and their role in preserving culture in the digital age. Now, um, one of the things that is important for us, to, our audience to understand is that museums and galleries, their role and mandate really is to conserve, preserve, document, and educate. And to this end, our focus has been on the face-to-face. -face. How do we get people out to our museums, developing exhibitions and programs that are really at the cutting edge of, um, <clears throat> of, of, um, of education curriculum? Um, and Oh, Dr. Stanley Naya is available. Okay, so I, what I'll do, Dr. Naya, is just present and and then and then jump in, and then you can just take from there um, to focus on these things. One of the things that the pandemic has done is that it has forced us to reevaluate how we do our engagement with the public and how we then do the engagement with the present. How do we document, conserve? Um, and preserve this current moment. Um, as, uh, as the curator of the University of the West Indies Museum and as a member of the board of the, of the Museums Association, we engaged in two key programs. The first was to survey our, the, our stakeholders. How were they managing in the pandemic? And then how do we develop the skill sets that they need to intervene or to adapt to this new moment. The second program that we did was a program around documenting the pandemic using visual artists. And that's available on the Museums Association of the Caribbean website, which is caribbeanmuseums.com. And New Museum also did a program around looking at historic um, pandemics regionally and their impact today. And that's also available through the UE Museum site. One of the things that we've recognized is that it's very important to have the infrastructure to do the digitization, to think about how do we move from the actual object collecting for museum and gallery spaces that are not object-based, and how do we then move forward with redirecting our role so that our public has access? Um, one of the things that we've discovered is that when, while we, our immediate response, which is to use, um, exist, use Zoom in very creative ways to document oral histories, um, to use other platforms to develop virtual exhibitions. One of the things that we have to do going forward is to develop the staff capacity to do for, to be not just about the one-on-one, -on -one, but also to engage in, um, in the kind of 
being able to digitize, being able to 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 better redirect that object to the through the education programming. Um, so one of the things that has happened is that a lot of spaces have done small features using Instagram, using Facebook. What we've done is that we've now we try as much as possible to stream our programs through Facebook. Um, in lieu of not being able to, let's say, use, you know, in the absence of a 360 degree camera to do virtual tours, what we've done is that we've done an actual tour recorded with access, uploaded it to our websites and social media platforms. So we've, we've done all of these things in a way to document, to increase access, but also to document the present. So one of the things is that the pandemic is really a aggressive changing moment. And so even though we are at home, our feelings, our response, the ways in which we're engaging it have changed over time, especially at this moment of vaccination. So one of the things that all of us are thinking about is ways in which to document this moment, because museums, especially object-based museums, are very heavily focused on object and documenting the past, but the present continuous also becomes the past. And so this digital age allows us to collect immediately and to make sure that we are documenting, but also improving our infrastructure to do what needs to be done to ensure that we can reflect on this moment in the next hundred years. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Shani. Dr. Roper there giving us her uh, remarks. I want to welcome you. Uh, we had a bit of a technical challenge on my side. You know, the internet in Jamaica can in fact be a little disruptive but I want to officially welcome you all to this panel, Museums, Heritage Institutions, and Cultural Memory in the Digital Age. We, we begin with this, with this panel this morning because it helps us to reflect on the role that spaces of preservation, um, spaces of heritage, spaces of cultural memory, uh, what, what these institutions mean for us in terms of um, you know, Kingston as a creative city. I want to now ask uh, Dr. Zachary Bayer, lecturer in the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of the West Indies, to give us his remarks. All right, all. Thank you so much, Dr. Naya, for, for the introduction. Dr. Shani Roper, uh, very pleased to be a part of this museum's heritage uh, panel all about the creative power and, and centering of, of, of downtown Kingston. Look, uh, again, I'm a, I'm a lecturer in archaeology uh, at UE Mona. Uh, so uh, I'm in the, involved in the activity of actually recovering, preserving, and presenting historical archaeological information to the public. So this information goes in museums, it's filtered into, into classrooms and, and beyond. So for today, I wanted to, uh, in this brief presentation, intentionally move outward from the creative capital of, of downtown Kingston to highlight some of the technological approaches of archaeology and heritage management at some of the sites surrounding the broader Kingston uh, uh, physical landscape and cultural, uh, cultural landscape. So we're going to be moving around the, the harbor here uh, in order to bring these, this toolkit and this, this approach back into the management of this, this powerful uh, downtown cultural center of, of Kingston. A again, acknowledging what, what the Honorable Minister Shaw raised about digitized and data-driven approaches. Uh, so in, in terms of a first case study, uh, this goes back to early history and heritage of, of some of the first Jamaicans at, at White Marl. So moving along in the Mandela Highway, this is a site currently threatened by development along that important economic corridor uh, as a result of highway, as a result of corporate complexes, Wincinco, Lasco, as well as the surrounding encroachment from the surrounding community. This is an incredibly significant site across Jamaica but also across the region where now rescue archaeologists, Yui Mona, Jamaican National Heritage Trust are out in order to properly study, document, preserve 
uh, cultural remains, uh, ceramics, artifacts, uh, uh, human remains dating to the last thousand years in a way that not only can place this information into the safekeeping of museums, but place it into the more active uh, position of people's mindsets, uh, classrooms. One of the most significant parts of this project has been a range of stakeholder collaboration, not only between educational and government agencies, but archeologists and the, the living surrounding community, uh, local schools, central village residents, uh, in a project that not only seeks to use advanced tools in, in scientific analysis, the ability to, to scientifically date organic remains or to do ancient DNA studies of, of, of individuals that, that lived in Jamaica uh, over a thousand years ago, but to, to again also place it into the, the popular space, the, the more familiar spaces of contemporary Jamaican life to really seek a what a, a project of, of, of Taino heritage in Jamaican yards, in in Jamaican uh, 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 domestic spaces that are that are that are quite familiar. So that's that's one of these case studies. And just quickly, more more to uh, I guess the home base of UWE, our entire university, the UWE Mona campus, is a significant historical site, ranging from 18th century plantation estates to mid 20th century wartime camps during World War II, refugees uh, uh, from Europe, uh, as well as internees, prisoners, uh, uh, were, were, were housed on this campus. This has provided an opportunity for service-based learning where archeology span history students and other volunteers are able to take part in this active, not only archeology span digging recovery, but also in the construction of mobile uh, exhibits that are uh, 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 artifact exhibits that are reinforced with, with uh, uh, popular forms of audio and, 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 and visual uh, uh, graphics, which add to, again, the, the monumentalization, the creation of public monuments, not only in physical form, but in the minds and the, self, and the processes of self-realization among our students really trying to activate archaeology by providing opportunities but also uh, consciousness and just finally all uh, one of the most exciting projects I've been able to take part on and and uh, Dr. Sonia Stanley Nye has been her work has been a big help here is combining uh, my my academic interests with the study of military forts which there are many scattering Kingston Harbor from the 16. 50s all the way up into World War II, the 19, 1940s. But at certain uh, sites, you can document the individual uh, 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 what markers of people in the past, but the same thing goes in the last 20 years. At sites like Fort Rocky, which dates to the 1880s to the 1940s, uh, since its abandonment has been used by modern Jamaicans in a variety of ways, including the application of graffiti, the recording of, of dance hall music videos since at least the, the early 2000s, which really provides a powerful layering of colonial military garrisons that then on top of that is a more contemporary garrison culture that, that really emanates from downtown Kingston. The reggae, the dance hall, the artistic vibes coming out of this creative capital are literally written on the walls of, of earlier historical sites. And, and Fort Rocky is currently under development uh, as one of the first entertainment centers. It's that type of layering that provides an incredible opportunity to combine the, the the power of the past with the power of the with the power of the present, and that's really where I'll end. Uh, that these are the type of tools and approaches in archaeology and heritage management that can be applied in downtown Kingston, an area of dense and and, and dynamic population center, big city problems, yes, crime, poverty, uh, struggles for development, but some very complex human histories that ideally we can bring together government, educational, community stakeholders 
create projects that not only beautify and inform this significant landscape, but empower residents and other and other stakeholders in the process of combining the old and new and creating fresh life into the future. So thank you all so much for this opportunity. Uh, uh, I, I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much, Zachary. Um, I, I always am so excited when I hear you speak because there are so many layers of cultural memory. We're looking here at archeology. span We're talking about heritage institutions, heritage sites, monuments, and even the educational opportunities around this. Um, we have also been traversing several disciplines here. When we think about the, the cultural memory in a, in a digital age, we are very squarely in the business of um, multidisciplinary approaches. And so I want to, without further ado, um, ask Mr. O'Neill Lawrence, who is Chief Curator of the National Gallery of Jamaica, to give us his remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Nair. Um, at the, I think like most of our institutions, we had to look at how the pandemic itself was affecting us. I think about two or three months into um, into the changed society that had been caused by the pandemic, our education department met and we had a very, what I consider to be a pivotal meeting in terms of trying to decide how we could continue to serve our publics. Because since we weren't allowed to allowed to have people come into the gallery for specific reasons. We needed to develop new strategies in order to reach them. And we also in that meeting decided that we would focus our attention largely on the people who we felt were most in need, the ones who had been reaching out to us the most. And those were the students who come to the gallery regularly, as well as teachers in that that in mind what we did we transformed our what what was an in-house project um right activity which was focused on csec uh visual art students and we produced a youtube video and a series of blog posts infographics that were and downloadable documents to assist them in the writing of their journals which are a main, main component of their examinations we also had a teacher seminar, an interactive teacher seminar that um, I think that was last year in November. And it was very well supported. But during all that time, one of the things that we had, we, we, what, what, that we took from that was the fact that even though we were engaging with digital technologies, we were using, you know, our different platforms, we we're using YouTube, we we're using Instagram, um, we're using our blog, we were still concerned about the issue of access. It's something that Mr. Mr. Anna Jones had mentioned earlier about, you know, what is the real access that people have? Well, we may be putting things on these particular platforms. Are we reaching as wide an audience as we would like? Because, you know, the assumption that a large component of our society can access um, the internet is a, li a, a little potentially problematic um and that's something that we're still trying to work through you know trying to see how we can utilize other methodologies you know either you know um whatsapp um, tele um text messages and so on to see if there are different ways that we can become more equitable in terms of what we are trying to do uh, and how we're trying to reach our different publics. Of course, we also try to, uh, after, you know, some experimentation, continue our last Sunday's program because we were really intent on making sure that we try to maintain the community that we had built over the last decade with the program. Um, that was also you know, a bit of a steep learning curve for us because, you know, it what was once a live event became a video production. So we are we are, we had and with that it came all of the various, you know, challenges that come with video production, uh, especially for a musical event. But we did that for some time. It was 
largely successful we looked at what was interesting with that with that program also was that we, we noted that we were our reach expanded in a different way we were reaching more people within diaspora so to speak um and we took note of that and while that was good we're still looking on ways in which when there is you know at some point post this particular period post you know when we're either post covid or we're better at living with covid how we can integrate those digital technologies into into a live technology into a live um event so to speak because what the reality of of, of, of this time is that when we move forward it's not it, it it's 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 a little ill-advised to think that we're going to ever go back to how things were what we have to do is use the lessons that we've learned now and 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 integrate them into a plan for the future uh i do have to point out also that with exhibition it has been a little challenging of course uh, and that is also an infrastructural issue shani had mentioned the need for that um because you know our our, the, our internet infrastructure in the gallery it's something that we're current we're in the process of upgrading because it isn't suited for you you would say you know virtual tours so to speak but what we did at our western branch uh national gallery west the exhibition that's currently there surreal black was curated specifically for uh for 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 presentation on social media so we have a YouTube tour that we have for that exhibition. We've done a, a virtual conversation with uh, Carla Moore, uh, who, who is based at the UA campus in Western Jamaica. And we're currently strategizing for more, for, 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 for different ways of engagement. We have a biweekly uh, presentation for children uh, make our mondays which is coming out on our youtube and instagram in instagram channel for national gallery west as well but at, at the end of it all we are still experimenting and we're still trying to see what would be the best way to expand the reach that we have tried to achieve so far um that's pretty much where we are right now as i said we are our education department is his currently he's strategizing as, as i said to see exactly how we can do more with the resources that we have and how we can still continue to serve our publics thank you very much thank you very much o'neill uh you know reminding us there about issues of access sustainable events um the use of social media new thresholds of learning um and even challenges of infrastructure especially pertaining to the internet in this digital age I want to really thank you for raising those issues for us. Um, I want to now ask Miss Georgia Rookwood, Senior Research Officer at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, to, to give us her remarks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Stanley Naya. I will be looking briefly on the role and functions of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. I will also briefly highlight the historical and cultural significance of downtown Kingston and mention some of the sites that are protected under the Jamaica National Heritage Trust Act. And lastly, I will address how digital technology has helped us or presented the opportunity for us to sustain our engagement with the public in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the Jamaica National Heritage Trust replaced the Jamaica National Trust Commission in 1985. Our functions include protecting through law sites that qualify to be declared as national monuments or protected national heritage, managing and maintaining specific heritage sites, providing technical advice to owners of heritage sites, conducting archaeological and historical research, and bringing history alive through heritage education. So, there are several sites in downtown Kingston that are protected under the Jamaica National Heritage Trust Act, and they all have a story. And when we look into the story of these sites, it, it reflects the riveting history of, of Kingston. You know, we know that Kingston traces its roots 
to the informal settlements established by the survivors of the 1692 earthquake that devastated Port Royal. And by the end of 1692, plans for the new town of Kingston was drawn up. And uh, the town originally was bounded by four streets, North Street, East Street, West Street, and Harbor Street. And over time, the town expanded. And with the earthquake and fire of 1907, you know, a large part of downtown Kingston was destroyed. And many of the sites in Kingston today date after the 1907 earthquake. You know, the use of bricks was largely dis discouraged because it felt that bricks were not able to withstand the shock. So many of these sites, looking at many of these sites, a lot of the information about the history of Kingston is normally related. So some of the sites downtown that are protected under the Jamaica National Heritage Trust Act include our historic churches, such as Coke Methodist Church, Kingston Parish Church, St. Andrew, Scotts Kirk, East Queen Street Baptist. There are also buildings of historic and architectural value, such as Headquarters House and the War Theatre historic sites like Liberty Hall, associated with our first national hero, the right and excellent Marcus Garvey, public buildings such as public buildings East and West on King Street, now a part of Justice Square. And we also have statues and memorials, you know, such as the Edna Manley's Negro Row sculpture on Ocean Boulevard. But I would want to point out that although protected by the GNHD law, most of these sites are not managed by the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. In fact, for Kingston, the Jamaica National Heritage Trust has oversight of Headquarters House, National Heroes Park, and sites in Port Royal. So we rely heavily on all our stakeholders in maintaining and also promoting these sites. So the COVID-19 pandemic brought to the fore how digital technology can sustain our engagement with the public. We have we had been contemplating using virtual tours to kind of broaden our engagement, but with the pandemic, this created a perfect opportunity and we were able to get initial funding through the Ministry of Culture to start our, our virtual tours projects. So we now have in place a four-year project which will run from 2021 to 2024, and it spans four phases. The creation of virtual museums for eight of our sites. So we'll begin with eight sites, and three of these sites are in fact in Kingston. So Headquarters House, National Heroes Park, and the old Naval Hospital in Port Royal. So as I'd mentioned through the Ministry of Culture, we were able to undertake phase one of the project which is the creation of the virtual platform. And that is done. So we are now seeking funding for the other three phases, which include the development of virtual tours for these sites, hosting and publication, training and capacity building. Now, we're hoping that phase three, which is the hosting and publication, will be done by the end of the financial year, March, 2022, and we can begin with sharing these eight sites with the wider public. And when phase four is completed, we intend, phase four is the training and development of staff. So staff will be trained in photogrammetry so we can add more sites to the platform. So we intend to add at least 100 or create at least 100 virtual tours using the staff. And this will facilitate expansion of our tours to feature much of downtown's historic sites, including the beautiful murals, murals that have been put in place, and to highlight the rich cultural history of the city with, with Jamaicans and the wider public. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for reminding us about the legislative platforms for protection that empower institutions such as the JNHD, um, the importance of research, uh, heritage sites and monuments, the management of these sites, and of course, virtual museums we heard about before from O'Neill, 
and the issues of training and capacity building um, where we are as heritage institutions, museums and so on, having to pivot in the same way that others have had to pivot in this um, digital age, but more importantly, through um, moments of austerity and um, challenges such as in, in the era we have now with COVID-19. I want to ask Miss Nicole Patrick Shaw, Deputy Executive Director at the Institute of Jamaica, to now give us her remarks. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all and to share with you what the Institute of Jamaica has been doing. And if it is that we're talking about technology, um, I thought it would be quite cute if it is that I shared with you a production that we had to do for the museum's day um, that had asked the question, the future of museums recover and reimagine. So I'm gonna share a video with you. while we await the loading of your video. Okay. All right, so the traditional perception that museums should operate as temple was never sufficient to feed the educational, cultural, social, and creative needs of this great nation. It needed to be more than a storage hub or a memory institution, but spaces of inclusion, a platform for discussion, an open option for learning for the disenfranchised, and to feed those who seek avenues for lifelong learning a creative space for the artist to blossom, a chill spot, or simply a space of self-discovery. The ownership of heritage was moved beyond the traditional institutional bounds and into the hands of peoples of society who must understand and make use of the past. It is perceived that heritage must serve society and its surrounding community in definable ways. Therefore, museums must remain fluid, responding to the needs of society, the policy directives of government and changes propelled by international influencers like UNESCO, ICOM, ICOM, MAC, to name a few. It is for this reason the Institute of Jamaica Act expanded the scope of the agency in 1978 and in 1995. This was to facilitate the protection and dissemination of information on Jamaica's tangible and intangible cultural heritage through the establishment and management of museums and galleries, for the collection, preservation, and display of artifacts, development of creative potential of children to collect and preserve information on our African heritage, compile, publish, and distribute printed information on literacy, scientific, and historical interests, conduct educational outreach, lecture seminars, and sociocultural events. As an agency of the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport, it is utilized as a cultural development tool to achieve the ministry's vision 2030 national development plan, medium term socioeconomic policy framework and priorities such as creating an authentic and transformational culture. Its actions are further guided by the national policy on culture and creative economy of Jamaica 2017 to 2027 with an objective to conserve restore Jamaica's heritage assets. The thrust to adopt technology has been exacerbated by the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. IOJ had to therefore change its business model quickly, whether or not it had the resources to do so effectively in order to remain relevant during its closure. The need to possess this digital presence has improved IOJ's ability For some reason, we have lost your audio. Maybe unmute. Okay. That we've done online publication, digital exam um, exhibitions, 
We have provided for we have provided free online learning resources, access to our ethnographic collections online. There are 12 websites on the IOJ umbrella, which includes our portal from which the public can access our cultural entities, which includes the Jamaica Clearinghouse Mechanism for Biodiversity and Jamaica Memory Bank, Jamaica's intangible cultural heritage site. All five reference libraries are now accessible online using the Koha library system. We now have live outreach programs using live video conferencing platforms such as Zoom, Google Meet, and Microsoft Teams. Pre- and post-production of events are uploaded to our YouTube channels, more require, which require more content management, script writing, and video recording skills that we never had before, so we have to learn. Live streaming of our events such as launch our concert using Instagram, Instagram Live or Facebook Live increase activity on our social media platform to create content that reflects the goals of the agency. Um, post, we needed a post to um, improve our social development, our social media development, um, increase the direct community's access to online services, utilizing the museum spaces for other educational needs not originally perceived. So we're having no partnership to access school, um, by members of our community, programs that help to build the social fabric of the community. We have increased our partnerships with NGOs to utilize our virtual spaces. So we have Art Connect, we have the National Child Month Committee utilizing our spaces, and we have partnership for content development. What are some of the other plans for the museum? E-commerce platform for our gift shop with the assistance of TP Deco increased content development program for IOJ by investing more in videography. We have the infrastructure to start an online radio for which we are currently investigating, um, improve access to the national collection and to allow public to make their own meanings from the artifacts. We decided that we want to do laser scanning, image technology, 3D imaging of artifacts. Um, these will provide new narratives for engagement as the visitors are enabled to uncover the meanings for themselves. IOJ is far from being a static authority. It has been in the past. Today's cultural heritage institutions are engaged in ongoing dynamic digital dialogues with its visitors. However, these changes have provided IOJ with the challenge of finding resources to digitize its catalogs and collections, developing and implementing websites and creating opportunities for visitors to engage with and even collaborate in their digital experiences. This technological thrust has also alienated a segment of the public that isn't computer literate or have access to smart devices. As we try to navigate the pandemic, technology provides IOJ with the only viable option to stay connected with the people if it, is, it was designed to serve. Appropriate policies must be adopted in order to create enablers that propel opportunities for museums to recover better and stronger as culture is a central pillar for sustainable development. And that's my comments. Thank you very, very much. The video is, is, is able to be shown now. So if you want, we can take your video now. Okay. Do we do that? Welcome to the Institute of Jamaica, established in 1879 for the encouragement of literature, science, and art. It was uniquely designed to help government in the advancement of culture in the island. We are the guardians of Jamaica's culture, an island of 2.7 million people whose name is recognized all across the world with other global titans. As Jamaica has advanced, People across the world have learned about our culture through our offerings and special library services. We are now in uncharted territory with the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly 90% or more than 85,000 museums worldwide have closed their doors due to this crisis. On March 10, 2020, Jamaica saw its first case while in the midst of a dengue fever epidemic. With our museums now physically closed, it is as if we are being severed from our people. Until the pandemic is completely under control, our museums are facing substantial income loss coupled with extreme security measures. 
visitor and income levels have dropped considerably due to COVID-19 restrictions and the traditional way of business just nah make it. In other words, not working. Some are calling this our new normal as physical lockdowns gradually become a constant feature of our society. Museums are faced with the stark reality of deciding. How do we keep all our stakeholders safe? How do we ensure the wellness of our teams? How do we adapt to meet the needs of our audiences? And how do we access support and financial assistance to build our capacity? Today marks a turning point in our story as we're reminded on this International Museums Day that museums can facilitate in the recovery process through the theme, the future of museums recover and reimagine. We will recover by developing strategies to boost our online presence in order to maintain a link with the public. As we move online, access to programs, events, collections and libraries are just a click away. With our footprint now online, we are getting more and more traction. We made the most of the lockdown by developing new content for our social media platforms and produce more programs for our YouTube channels. The contribution of this new content on social media has helped our museum to transcend from mere brick and mortar to the digital realm. Because of our desire to serve you, we will recover. We must recover. We have provided continued means of engagement as we want to stay connected with you. We recover by taking advantage of the digitization of our existing collections with the inclusion of our mobile and virtual museums, online library, development of 360 tours, online publications, and even online classrooms. Our recovery is ongoing and we are trying new ideas to close the gap. We recover by breaking away from the more traditional activities and have taken advantage of the deserted rooms to present an offbeat view of the museum's collections. As we enter a new phase globally, one that will test our resources, museums like IOJ will be vital in not only helping our citizens rebuild after COVID-19, but will also aid in reimagining a more just and sustainable future. Let us recover stronger together. Thank you so much, uh, Nicole Patrick Shaw. We have had an extensive view there of the Institute of Jamaica, that ecosystem that is so vital to the preservation of cultural heritage um, in Jamaica. Thank you for reminding us that heritage must serve society and its surrounding community. Communities, um, this, is, this is really an important um, reminder for us, especially because what we're doing in a city like Kingston is very much about serving the very people who have sustained these cultural assets over uh, centuries. Our very last speaker, Ms. Sarah Shabaka, is co-director of Cone Shabaka Design Limited, and I want to ask her to give us her remarks. Thank you, Dr. Stanley Nair, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to share um, my presentation today, which is basically on um, a digital app that I've been working with Kingston Creative to develop over these past few months. And the app is a culture and an app for the culture and creative industries. Um, it overlaps with a lot of the conversations that have been shared in this presentation. And um, essentially, um, sorry, excuse me. Henry. To get into my sorry, I wanted to see if I could share from um, 
dengan UVM. Um, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a print version of the map that we've been looking at for downtown Kingston and Port Royal. And this is really the zone of what our digital app focuses on. We have categorized um, different creative industries such as um, theatre, murals, art, um, museums and galleries, and mapped the map of downtown Kingston. This is a progression from an existing map that we have been developing with Kingston Creative. And the point is really that there's some people who love print, right? And there's some people who are always on their phones. So this is a way to access into um, the app through scanning a QR code um, on the top left. Now, bear in mind, this is all prototype as a big idea of a project that we have been working on for the last um, few months. And when I say we, I have a team of about six to 10 people who all have a skill set in different areas such as um, music or um, photography, writing, augmented reality, virtual reality. So the app aims to combine all these different types of content um, and to basically it focus on these things. It's a it's an art district map. Um, it's a map that you go into straight when you download this app, and it's an opportunity to navigate the creative city of music through streaming platforms and going into locations, being able to drop into a location and hear the soundscape of that place. So you can also explore cultural spaces, um, watch videos, see pictures, shop or book a tour. Um, the other aspect of this app is for tour booking. It's a great opportunity to put all these locations on a map. And that's what we're most excited about. In that previous slide, you saw a print version which only can hold, obviously, because it's print, 60 locations. But within the digital space, you can have you know, an infinite number of um, locations that are relevant to this app. And that's what we're really trying to do. We're categorizing all these types of creative industries, opportunities to visit, um, different sites, shops, culinary, fashion, etc., music and dance, um, to provide this wonderful opportunity to explore digitally and to be able to book a tour and have it in your calendar, pay for the tour um, through you know, different forms of transactions and have a, um, a ticket where you show up on the day. And so I'm just going to walk you through and, and explore your tour. Um, and there are different types of tours as well. We have um, physical tours, audio tours, virtual tours. Um, so there's lots of different ways that people, even if they're not in Jamaica, can see what is happening in Kingston and the vast wealth of um, creativity that is here. And the other aspect of the tour is an e-commerce site. And um, this is an e-commerce platform. It's um, a responsive website that you see, you can also see on your mobile phone. And it shows all different types of the, um, the makers who are making these amazing things in, in painting and in, in glasswork and ceramics and fashion, music. You can also book classes, events, um, and all types of things that you could actually pay for and, and um, acquire. So I actually just... Um, refine this really way down to just show you some different types of screens um, that the user would do. So obviously in the onboarding onto the app, um, the user can choose the different categories they're interested in. If you're interested in museums and galleries, you could click on that and the map could show all the locations of museum, museums and galleries in downtown Kingston and Port Royal. And um, you can also choose to have push notifications. So when you're on a location on a tour, you could also um, know what restaurants and cafes are in the area or, um, or shops for that matter. 
and things that connect to where you are um, on a location. And then we've got user onboarding for music streaming services. So um, you can explore the map and downtown in a variety of ways. But the first thing that you come to, which leverages the UNESCO designation of um, the Creative City of Music, is music and the map together and combined. Um, within our categories, you know, this screen is showing how you can select the category for the art district. The art district, we've been working on with Kingston Creative and developing in a variety of ways with these amazing murals in many different areas of downtown Kingston. So the right screen, you'll see the list of them. So you could go to um, to Water Lane and do and click on Water Lane and go on a Water Lane tour. Um, these tours are even now um, really popular. People love these walk, walking tours um, with a tour guide. You can also have an audio tour. Um, there are other types of tours. There are heritage tours. So you can go to Fort Charles and we're working with, um, you see right now, and IDB to develop different types of content for these heritage sites. So for Fort Charles, we're working on augmented reality in Giddy House, for example. And um, but within the app, and, and that will be something that's on location, but also within the app, there's an opportunity to see a gallery of images, watch a video, um, look at archival images of historical paintings and um, get information about um, everything to do with the earthquake or the different restaurants that are in the area or um, the first guest had mentioned Fort Rocky. That's definitely going to be one of these locations on this site, um, on this avenue. And then the locations going back again to Water Lane, we've got locations that will have augmented reality on site. And that just provides a really magical experience for a, a visitor. Um, I've actually been on some of these walking tours where we've shared the AR that's already active in some of our murals. And um, people love it. It just provides this layer of um, um, a very contemporary approach and like exciting content and fun. It can be um, organized for different demographics. It incorporates music. It um, highlights the artist who's produced this mural. And um, it's just this added takeaway and layer of information onto these amazing paintings. Um, so within the app, there's opportunity to um, book the tour and get further information. Um, you can put it onto your calendar and um, see the available dates. You can sign up for your payment options. We're looking into opportunities for um, wireless transactions. And a big part of this app um, in our next phase is going to be the partnerships that we develop with financial institutions as well as you know internet and wi-fi in the, in the areas um you'll get a digital ticket that you can show on the day of your um tour um when you're on to, on site you can um experience the ar that screen on the ar the screen on the right is your camera um the show your camera and showing that you can access the AR on that day. You can also see what food places are in the area or shop. Um, you get your push notifications. You'll get information about the artists. And this is an example of, um, um, of uh, just for the for water lane, but it actually applies to all these different locations. So one of the challenges within this is developing content and how do we work with these different organizations and entities to get this content and in the past discussions that i've been listening to it seems like there's a, an amazing wealth of content that's being developed and so i'm really excited about partnerships and how we can work together to populate this app with really strong um interesting short concise and really engaging content um 
this last, um, these last two images on the right look at um, events that you can see all the events that are happening in Kingston um, for sports so across a range of uh, categories. And um, as mentioned, there's an aspect on the right, the menu option on the right for shop allows you to see and shop all these different parts, book classes, book tours, and it translates into a website. So for people who aren't in Kingston, Jamaica, they can still see what's happening and plan their trip in that way, and also have access to virtual tours. Um, and this is a view of the e-commerce website. So you could um, in, you know, get discounts and things, look at all the new products, um, book a class, a ceramics class, or a cooking class, or a painting class, um, book your tours, see the map, see where you are in location to the map, and also download that as well. And that concludes my presentation. Wow, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I am excited about the future of museums, heritage institutions, and cultural memory management in Kingston. Um, a very exciting presentation there. And of course, showcasing the ongoing work around the Art District app for Kingston with multiple tour options. I'm going on those tours. Thanks for, for bringing the virtual tours to life for us, reminding us about the opportunities and indeed the opportunity costs of using digital solutions building out an ecosystem of tours and heritage sites, the need for content development and management. Those are important reminders for us. Now, I know that we're completely out of time in, in terms of this panel. And my intention was to ask each of you, um, in this time, in this age, what do you see of the future of uh, cultural memory and heritage institutions in the digital age, considering the dynamic attention economy um, around um, especially Kingston, Kingston as a creative city. And, and so I will ask you, you know, in your own way, just give us your um, brief 10 second closing remarks as we close out this panel this morning. I'll, I'll go first since we're just going to order which is started. Um, for me, I think that it's it's time we in the future we'll be trying to straddle the, the the balance between the virtual and the visitor. And one of the things that we will see in the future is more dynamic engagements, both in terms of the creation of exhibitions, our public outreach options, but more importantly, thinking about how effectively we earn income from the new virtual. I think at the end of the day, one of the things that for those of us, other than the, um, for what um, Dr. Sabaka has showed us, that one of the things that we all have to think about as institutions is our going forward in terms of our online product and earning proper income, not just through our outreach, our proper income to continue to maintain these infrastructures. But I do think the future is bright and it's definitely requiring us to think outside of the box and to expand, expand and adapt our reach and learning and training. And it's good, good, it's a good field for the future for those who want to enter the field of museums, galleries and cultural preservation. <clears throat> Uh, and I, I would just add to that, uh, uh, th and thank you, Dr. Roper, for leading the way on that. Uh, and I, I tried to bring out in my in my quick presentation, looking at sites outside of downtown Kingston, the, the tools and the links that are required to do this, advanced tools, digital tools, but most importantly, a link to uh, surrounding communities, uh, governmental agencies that are all are involved in in this work. So tools and links uh, uh, just would would underscore that as the as the way forward. Thank you all. Um, I I I I'm I'm also adding to Shani because she said a very a, a very significant base for my statement, but that what we also really need to do in considering Kingston. Um, and considering all the potentiality that is within Kingston is to continue experimenting, but also make sure that in terms of the ways that we can reach our communities, both 
um, immediate and international, but also to make sure that we're also we're always taking note of the most effective means that we have been able to either execute or 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 or, or analyze so that we know what we're doing and we are being as effective as possible with the usage of these technologies. Okay. I, I would add that uh, I agree with everything that everyone has said so far. And uh, I think it's very important for the for capacity building in the heritage sector for us to develop the digital skills. So I think going forward, it would be good for funding to be made available to the heritage sector, you know, um, so that this can be built out and, and shared with the public because culture has, has a, a very significant place to play in the development of any society. Thank you. Okay. All right. So for me, yes. okay. All right. So for me, I love the direction. I love the impact that this is a positive for me because with the influx of technology, the museums have been forced to redesign how we develop our products and our services to feed the different learning needs of children right across the board. Um, is looking more than just doing face-to-face -face program, to, but how do we do programs that um, can reach not only the local community, but the international community. It is changing the design of those programs. It is forcing museums to be engaged in different fields, which it's um, marketing, digital marketing, script writing, content development, um, which is changing how we see content. We are now forced to um, create content that is strongly intertwined with what is being in school, and we are much more purpose-driven. Um, we are now being forced to do more monitoring and evaluation of our pro programs to ensure that they hit the point in terms of the target audience that we want to meet. My only challenge is funding, because if it is that we are being pushed in this direction, we definitely going to need the resources to enable us to build that capacity, if it is that we need to remain relevant. Thank you. And can we have final remarks then from Sarah? Thank you. Um, I would like to say that um, for me, it's always been about collaboration. And um, it's just my mindset and projects and also in, um, my, in lecturing. And that collaboration spans from um, stakeholders and um, different resources and the whole gamut of content creators and creative practitioners and um, shared knowledge. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in how we can all share and make this um, just, I mean, in a way, you kind of put things on a map, which it already is on the map, but let us see that in can be generated. And in the museum sector, the museum sector is so important, and the culture is so important. And, you know, people are, you know, coming here dying to have a National Sports Museum or a, a Reggae Museum. And these are these things that, you know, how can we make that happen and they become very um, exciting and contemporary and a must place to go and people can access these opportunities in different ways. So um, yes, there's a question of funding. There's also a question of just uh, right, collaboration, not overall back, collaboration. Not um, with the different schools and um, different creative makers and um, and you know what I really love about the app is that it brings so many different people to that experience. There's a huge skill set and it just is under one umbrella it brings all these um, makers and creators and visionaries together. But I can't. So, so. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. You have all in some way touched on the challenges, the present, the plans, and even solutions to challenges in your various institutions and spheres. Um, we definitely have been pointed to the future um, in terms of cultural memory and cultural heritage management. I want to thank you all so much. It has been my pleasure um, being your moderator this morning. Thank you. Absolutely excellent. What an amazing discussion there. Our first panel discussion on museums and a heritage. Thank you to Dr. Sonia Stanley Nair from the Institute of Caribbean Studies for leading the conversation with our expert panelists. We want to say thank you to Zachary Beer, cultural heritage archaeologist. Thank you to Shani Roper, head of the UWI Museum. O'Neill Lawrence, National Gallery of Jamaica, Miss Georgia Rockwood, and uh, Miss Nicole Patrick Shaw from IOJ Division of the Ministry of Culture, and also Sarah Shabaka from the Kingston Creatives Tour. And um, I am excited, I'm absolutely excited to see how we will be transforming our, our culture and our heritage and moving forward with the use, of course, of technology, really pushing past the point of comfort and, you know, adapting while maintaining our authenticity. It will not be easy. We understand that there will be challenges, but it is not impossible. And that's why we are excited about what will come in the near future. Very happy about the app, very happy about the interaction. Of course, we have the concerns of how payments will work, etc. but I'm sure as we move along, uh, the concerns will be resolved and we will look towards something that will be sustaining, far-reaching and great at preserving our rich cultural heritage. Thank you again to the panelists.